All around the world, men and women, people of all ages, have witnessed the awesome manifestation of God's presence, power, and His love rendered in words, words beyond the written pages. Why are we preaching like this? Why do we travel all around the world preaching the gospel? Because Jesus is coming again. And he left us with a message to tell the untold. A message for the whole world. This message of faith in God and his unfailing word has brought about change in the lives of millions around the world. An improvement that brings many more to such meetings with the man of God, knowing that their lives will never be the same again. Today we bring you excerpts from a special meeting with our man of God, Pastor Chris. Pastor Chris, worth hearing. God has an eternal plan. An eternal plan is a plan that will not change. Okay? It's his plan. That's his method. That's what he's going to do, no matter what happens. God's eternal plan is to work with man through his word. It's his word. You may want him to do it any other way, but it's not going to happen. He's going to do it through his word. God's plan is to build you through his word. You know, when we started this discussion, I told you that God created the world, according to the Bible, with his word. So you are in a world that was created by the word of God. Which means everything is ordered by words. Everything in the world is ordered by words. And you want to take your life from one level of glory to another, you're going to have to learn to use the word. See, there are many Christians. I mean, they've been Christians for many years. They grew up in church, but they have never learned to use the Word of God. They've never learned it. Very committed Christians. They're committed. They love God. They are passionate about the things of God. But their lives have never been victorious. The circumstances in the world always get them. They always find themselves like they're trapped. When things are happening in the world, they get trapped. Always they are in a difficult situation, not knowing what to do. Praying and hoping. Praying and hoping. You say, hello brother, how are you? Says, we're struggling. Some say, we're trying. We're struggling. And, and it's a picture of the life that they have come to know. It's the life they have come to be acquainted with. It's, the, it's their daily struggle. They're struggling. And they're right. Life has been a struggle for them. So they have the idea that God is merciful to some people and God doesn't care about some others. They think that, oh, you know, if things are going all right for you, it's because God... It's just merciful to you. So if not because of the mercy of God. Let me tell you something. The mercy of God is given to all of us. That's what the Bible says. The grace of God is given to all of us. All of God's children can take advantage of his grace. So it's not like God has given that grace and um, 
He gave to some and he will not give to some. No, 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 no. Grace for you to live a victorious life has been given to you in Christ Jesus. That will not change. He's not going to reduce it. He's given it to you. And then there's a beautiful thing in the word of God. If you need more grace, you say, what if I need more grace? If you need more grace, you don't have to pray about it. According to the Bible, you take it. I'll show you these things from the Bible, from the word of God. You know, if God says my people are destroyed, defeated, paralyzed, broken because of the lack of knowledge, not the lack of power. Not the lack of power. And then there are those who are praying for more and more anointing. That one is a big problem. When you were born again, you were born by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Now, that's a simple thing. It's so simple, we don't even notice the power of it. It's so simple. We don't even notice it. But I, I want to bring it again to your mind so you understand what that really is. I said, when you were born again, remember, Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In explaining what it is to be born again to Nicodemus in the Bible, Jesus emphasized that it was being born of the spirit of God. Through the word of God. Because Peter tells us, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So you're born again by the Holy Spirit through the word of God. What does that mean? That makes you a child of the Holy Spirit. Now in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, the Bible calls Jesus Christ the child of the Holy Spirit. Which means that you are as much a child of the Holy Spirit as Jesus is. So when you were born again, you were born of the same life that Jesus has. No wonder the Bible says that we have the same nature. We have the nature of God. The very nature of God. Now, the whole essence of the gospel being given to us is first to make us children of God. Secondly, to build us in that life. Which means the secret of the real Christian is to learn how to live the supernatural life that he has now been born into. Most don't know anything about it. They're born again, but they don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. And if you don't know, you will suffer the same things like the one who doesn't know God. They suffer the same things. Circumstances become master over them. Terrible. No, I will never be subject to circumstances. Because I'm born again. I'm born again. I'll never be subject to circumstances. Jesus said, you are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. That's what Jesus said. You are not of the world. He said, I am not of the world. And he told us, you are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So it doesn't matter what happens around us. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. We are not supposed to be victims. We are victors. You have to understand the mentality that God gives to us through his word. Let me show you two verses. Let's just take a look at these two verses. St. John's Gospel, chapter number 16 and verse 33. St. John's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse number 33. Jesus is talking here. And he says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. 
Hallelujah. No confusion. He says, in me, I have spoken to you so that in me you might have peace. In the world, you shall have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer. That means cheer up. <laughs> Read the rest of it. That's what Jesus said. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Why did Jesus use that terminology? That ex expression, I have overcome the world. Remember, this is the 16th chapter of St. John's Gospel. By this time, Jesus was getting ready for the crucifixion. He is in the last phase of his ministry here. He is teaching the last subjects. Some of the most important things that Jesus ever said were in St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. Very important things. Because from then on, he was getting ready for the end of his earthly ministry. In these verses, he taught so much about the power of the word, the spirit of God coming, you know, the, the, uh, the victorious life that he's given us. An expose on, on, on the prayer of the God kind, you know, by listening to him pray. And the words of prayer, how he taught so much in there. Glory to God. So here he says to them, he had lived three and a half years already in ministry. Okay? These three and a half years of ministry were being concluded at this time. And his disciples were listening as he kept emphasizing to them the importance of these last days that he was having with them. And then he said to them, I know because I've told you that I'm leaving, your heart is full of sorrow. He said, no, don't worry. See, he said, it's to your advantage that I go away. He said it to them. He says, it, it's to your advantage that I go away. He said, because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. He said, but if I leave, then the Holy Spirit will come. So he's teaching these things and finally says to them, cheer up. I have overcome the world. He had faced different kinds of temptations, trials, challenges. And the Bible shows us he overcame them all. So now he says to his disciples, cheer up, I have overcome the world. He teaches these wonderful things and finally goes to Gethsemane. In the garden. Where the final battle. With deciding to obey God. Or not. That was the battle of obedience. At the garden of Gethsemane. And he won. Straight from there. He was arrested and to the cross he went and won the victory for us. Now, let's listen to one of his disciples, John. Now, go to first epistle of St. John, chapter 5, and let us read verse number 4. First epistle of St. John, chapter 5, and verse number 4. <laughs> I like it. I want you to read it. Want to go. Faith. Our faith. How important your faith is. I told you, you've got to build your faith. 
See, coming to the house of God like this is, is one of the most important ways of building your faith. Because you expose yourself to what you call the corporate, the, the corporate ministry of the word. And while the Spirit of God is ministering to us like that, so much can come to you. Because everyone is pulling the word with faith. So a lot is being released. You see, whatever I'm going to be sharing with you, it's not just based on what I plan to share with you. It's more than that. It is more based on what your spirit is pulling out than what I came with. How much you're causing the spirit of God to bring to you as I minister to you. And when you're in a place like this with several other people who've got faith, they're all pulling. But I'm only one person. But the Spirit of God will have to speak. And as he speaks, his word is like the sun that shines. And everybody can get out of the sun whatever he wants. Glory to God. So the importance of building your faith. We are in some of the most dangerous times in man's days on earth. In some of the most troublous times. And the worst is yet to come. But. Equally so. Is what the word of God has told us. He says that gross darkness shall cover the earth. Then he said. But. God's light will shine upon you and on your path. But there's something beautiful about what I just said that you've got to understand. Isaiah the prophet saw the glory of God. Something he didn't see was what Paul said was hidden in different ages. But in the days of the church became manifested. I call it Christ in you. The hope of glory. The revelation of the light that Isaiah saw. Paul said shines through you. Which means that when you come anywhere. You will not have to pray for the light of God to shine. You will not have to pray that the glory of God will come into that situation. I want you to listen to this because it is so important. Because there are many Christians who are in different kinds of situations and they are praying that the glory of God will be manifested in that situation. That is not going to happen. You may be waiting for a miracle in that situation for nothing. It's not going to happen. And that's the reason many have been disappointed time after time. Because they don't understand the ministry of the New Testament. You cannot pray for God to bring forth his glory into a situation. Because that's not going to happen in this New Testament. In the New Testament, God's plan is that his glory is in you. Your presence in that situation is God's glory. Are you following this? The thing is that so many of us have been, you know, we, we were raised in situations where people complained a lot. We are so acquainted with those who complain, people who are dejected, discouraged, complaining, frustrated, defeated. We have seen so many people defeated in life that we almost think that we are supposed to be like them. To the point that when we see those who are successful, we think that either they are doing something wrong or they are just lucky. Or maybe their success is for a time. That after some time, they will come back like our defeated selves. You know, I tell people, I will always be successful. I'll always be. I'll always be successful. And there's a reason. Christ in me, the hope of glory. 
the hope that I have that tomorrow is going to be more glorious for me than today is Christ in me. Christ in me. The hope that I have that in any situation I find myself, I'm going to come out victoriously is Christ in me. I don't have to pray for God to manifest himself there. No, because he's already settled in me. He lives in me. He is manifested in me. If I'm in that situation, God is in that situation with me. That's why he says, count it all joy when you go through diverse tests. He says, count it all joy. Let's read that scripture again. First John chapter 5 verse 4, where we had it on the screen a moment ago. For whatsoever, whatsoever, anything. <laughs> Did you notice? It's not whosoever. A few translations say whosoever, but they're not right. It is more generic. It is whatsoever, anything that is born of God. Which means, apart from the fact that I am one that is born of God, when the word of God is released from my lips, because it is born of God, that means it hails from God. That is the meaning of whatsoever is born of God. It means anything that proceeds from God. So when I speak God's word, because it is God's word, whatsoever is from God, originates from God, overcomes the world. So I bring forth the word of God into that situation and it overcomes the world. So you see, in every way I win. There has to be a consciousness of who you are in Christ. Because you can't live beyond your consciousness. Your boldness in life depends on your consciousness of who you are. The results you will have in life depend on your consciousness of who you are. Why are some people bold and some are full of fear? There are people who are full of fear. They hear a sound in the night and they're shaky. Children don't know fear until their parents teach them to fear. A child doesn't know fear. He learns fear from his parents, from those in his environment. He learns fear from them. You have to learn fear. In the same way you can learn faith. Learn faith. You learn faith from the world. Learn faith from those who walk by faith. I, I, I don't like hanging around people who are negative. No. I, 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 it's either I'm talking or I'm out of there. People who are full of negativity, full of fear, they always see the wrong side of things. They always see that things are not going to work out. No, 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 no. No, no, no. They are a source of weakness in the system. Hang around people who, who talk faith. Hang around people who receive results of faith. Hang around those who trust in God and put his word to work. Hallelujah. I'm born of God. Yeah. I know who I am. I'm born of God. Hallelujah. Yeah, let's look at another thing here. Hmm. You know, when, when Jesus, uh, some of us, uh, uh, this is easy for us, but uh, uh, I like, uh, I don't think the word of God was written for nothing. It's not an assumption. It's not a story. The Bible is not a storybook. <laughs> You know what I love about the New Testament? Of course, um, you know, some people think we don't like the Old Testament. But I, I quote a lot from the Old Testament as I do from the New. But the New Testament is very important. I won't tell you why. Because the New Testament is not about what others did and what they got.
I'm talking about, you know, when I say New Testament now, I'm not just looking at the New Testament section of the Bible from Matthew to Revelation. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not New Testament. They are in the New Testament section of the Bible, but you see, they are Old Testament because Jesus lived in the Old Testament. Do you understand that? Okay. So the teachings of Jesus were mostly for Old Testament folks. So you want to understand the teachings for the New Testament, you have to go to the epistles. Are you hearing what I'm saying? For example, in the epistles, you don't find teachings about faith. No? Jesus taught faith to the Old Testament folk. In the New Testament, we're told that God has dealt to every one of us the measure of faith. But Jesus said to those people, his disciples in the Old Testament, he said, how come you don't have any faith? One time he said, how come all ye of little faith, little? One time he said, you don't have any. So they grew from not having any to having some little ones. But for us, see, where did the New Testament begin? After the death of Jesus Christ, the New Testament came into effect. Okay? Because a testament is of no power until the death of the testator. But the inheritors or heirs of the New Testament were born after the Holy Spirit came. For the Bible says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So until the Holy Spirit came to begin his ministry from the day of Pentecost, no one could be born again. So the heirs were born from when the Holy Spirit came. Are you following this? Very, very important. Very, very important. So they are born with faith in them. He says, God has dealt to every one of you the measure of faith. Not one of us has no faith. We all have faith. You are born with faith the moment you're born again. And you're born righteous the moment you're born again. The righteousness with which you are born when you're born again is the very righteousness of Christ Jesus. You cannot increase it and you cannot reduce it. Are you following this? You can't increase your righteousness and you can't reduce your righteousness. Because the righteousness given to us with which you were born again is a gift. That's what Romans chapter 5 verse 17 tells you. You were given the gift of righteousness to live with. And that gift of righteousness is in your spirit. It's a twofold righteousness. On the one hand, it is a legal righteousness. On the other hand, it is a vital righteousness. Which means your new nature is vitally righteous before God. And by virtue of what Christ did for you, you are legally righteous. Are you following this? So being born again is a totally different life. We are victors in Christ. We must lift our vision. We must lift our vision. We're not of the world. I've got to explain something to you that's very important. Now, there are two words in the Bible, two words used for world, okay? Uh, from the Greek in the New Testament, two important ones. One is cosmos, and the other one is aeon. Now, the cosmos refers to the earth in the government of things in the earth. The earth and the way things are arranged, the structure of things, and the government of things in the earth. Do you get it? So I'm explaining it to you in a generic form now. The simplest way you can understand it. Now, the second one, which is aeon. Aeon refers more to the cause of life. The cause of life. Uh, have you ever heard this term? 
the life and times of John Smith. Okay? The life and times of John Smith. Or the life and times of uh, uh, Bobby Bear. The life and times of Adewale something, you know, whatever. Life and times. That's the, you, you're referring to his aeon. The way things went with him, the course of his life, how things went with him. It also refers to an era, a period of time, and the way things were done at that time. Are you following this now? Hmm. Why sometimes it is important for us um, to pick some of the uh, words in the in the original translation, we call it original, but that's not really original, but it's the, the version from where the English was translated. The English version of the New Testament came from the Greek translation. Okay? Why the English version of the Old Testament came from the Hebrew translation. And sometimes we have to look at this originals to, so that we don't keep ourselves as uh, limited to the limitation of the translators. Do you get it? Because language is dynamic. And sometimes we want to know um, what, was it, what exactly was said that the guy translated. Was he right or wrong? So we try because um, they were scholars, mostly. And so if they were scholars, we too could be scholars and find out what did they really say? Were they right or wrong? Glory to God. So I'm explaining those two simple words for a reason. Because in the English version, you just have word, word. So the idea is that you're talking about the same thing every time you see the same word. But the, the, the version, the Greek version from where they translated it, didn't use the same words. And, and their differences are vital. Hallelujah. Okay, let's speak a few just to show you exactly what this means. When Jesus said in that scripture that we read, St. John's Gospel chapter uh, 16 and verse 33, where he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the cosmos. Okay? I have overcome the cosmos. Everything, the aggregate of earthly things. Their structure and government. That's amazing. That's amazing. And who, who was running that structure? Who was running that structure? Satan. Jesus called him, St. John chapter 14. Go to verse 30. St. John chapter 14, verse number 30. He says, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world, the prince of this cosmos, cometh and hath nothing in me. Satan. Jesus says, Satan is the prince of this cosmos. Now, he's referring, referring to as the ruler. The word prince there means ruler. The one who governed the earth. How did he take over it? When Adam sold out to Satan. That's when he became the prince of the cosmos. And Jesus says, the prince of this world comes and he's got nothing in me. He's got nothing in me. Hallelujah. And over in the 16th chapter, Jesus says, Chair, I have overcome the cosmos. I have overcome the cosmos. So that tells us something about the termination of Satan's dominion over the earth.
So one more thing. He's called the God of the Aeon. And that refers to how things go, the systems that have been run at different periods of time. But we are not of that world. We don't belong in his system. We don't belong in his system. He has no dominion over us. He blinds the unbelievers, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4. Turn there, let's look at it. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. Have you seen it? Good. In whom the God of this world, this time the world is not cosmos, is aeon. So God of this world hath blinded Blinded the minds of them which believe not. You see, people who don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, now we know why they don't believe. Because Satan blinded their minds. They are under the dominion of Satan. They are under the power of darkness. So they have difficulty following the things of God. Because Satan blinded their minds. Look at it there. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. He's blinded them, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So he stopped them from seeing the light of God. But they think, they think they're in charge of their lives. No, but they are, their lives are being run from the realm of the spirit. So they don't know it. So the guy thinks he understands what he's doing. I'll never believe that. I don't believe that. But see the guy that blinded him, Satan. That's why he doesn't know it. But we are sent, just like Paul, let me show you something. In Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. He sent us to do what? Open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Praise God. So who is to open their blind eyes? Us. He didn't say that we should pray that God will open their eyes. No, he sent us to open their eyes. When we bring them the gospel, their eyes will be opened. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Mm. Hallelujah. Here comes an insightful teaching on the triumphant life of a believer. Spiritual understanding. Expounding on the book of Colossians, the man of God, Pastor Chris, teaches on the foundational principles of being fruitful and increasing in the knowledge of God's Word. There's a difference between mental understanding and spiritual understanding. He's talking about the understanding that comes from God. God's ways of seeing things. As you do listen to this audio message by Pastor Chris, you will be transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost as you gain a deeper insight and understanding of the importance of the Word of God. Spiritual Understanding. To order, please call the following numbers now showing on your screen, or you can download to your mobile device from the Pastor Chris Digital Library app on Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, we were united with him and in him in his death. See, I want you to look at the legal side of this thing now. It's very important.
We say Jesus died for us. Okay? That means he died in our place. It's like um, you are paying for someone who's owing a debt. And so when you come to pay, even though your name is not written down as the debtor, you're paying for the guy who, who made the debt. Your name is not there. It's his name. So you are coming there to do it in his name. So you pay the debt, and he is what? Free. Because he paid in you. He was united with you when you made the payment because you paid on his behalf. Is that correct? Yes. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Okay. So that is what you call the redemption. Now, from that redemption came an awesome, marvelous, unforeseen by most blessing and opportunity. Most didn't know what was coming. All they saw was the redemption. But Ezekiel said something they didn't understand. A new heart will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take the stony heart out of your flesh. Glory to God. He said, I'll put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my ways. Many didn't see that coming. So God's purpose was not the redemption. God's purpose was the result of fruit. Mm, come on here. It was... The, the fruits of the redemption. The new creation came from the redemption. Man now being redeemed, it became possible for the new creation to be born. So the church didn't come from the cross. The church came from after the resurrection, not from the cross. Are you following what I'm saying? This is important. Now, what's the reason for this legal explanation? We were united with him in his death, meaning he died for us. We were united with him in his burial, meaning that when he was buried, we were buried in the mind of justice, in the mind of God. All right? And when God raised him from the dead, we were united with him in his resurrection and in his ascension to glory. Are you catching that? Yes, and when he came from heaven to the disciples, where they were afraid, they had the doors locked, windows locked for fear of the Jews, what did Jesus say when he entered? Say it again. All hail. All hail. The victory had been won. All hail. Which means... We were united with him in his victory over Satan. He had the dominion over the world, the flesh, and the devil. He defeated Satan completely, completely. What does that make us? Masters over demons. So demon spirits know that we are their masters. All demon spirits know it. The only people who don't really know it are many Christians who are seeking help to be delivered from demons. They say, please, pastor, please, uncle, please, auntie, pray for me. Demons are troubling me. But you are a master over demons. And the demons know. They're only trying to stop you from knowing it. You know, there's a lot of teaching to make us behave like the world. To make us not expect the supernatural. And we must not subject ourselves to that. You're going to have to start practicing the supernatural. If you have not been doing it. You have to.
practice who you are. Live the life that God has given you. Don't just keep quiet and allow things to rot. Don't just keep quiet and allow Satan to destroy your life. Don't just keep quiet. Then you get broke. And, and until you're just frustrated thinking, where will I get money? Who do I? I need somebody to help me. You need somebody to help you? How can you come to a helpless situation? How did you arrive here? Jesus said, I will not leave you helpless. You never read it? I will not leave you helpless. He said, I will come to you. And then he came to us by the Holy Spirit. That's what he promised. He said he will send the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to the Father. And when I get to the Father, I'm going to ask him to send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came. And now the Holy Spirit lives in us. This Holy Spirit that lives in you. Why can't he supply your own needs? How can you be that broke? Say, I refuse to be broke. You're going to have to use your mouth. How many of you use your mouth in eating every day? How many of you? How many of you forgot to use your mouth to eat? You wanted to eat, but you forgot to use your mouth. How many of you forgot? You forgot to use your mouth. I just want to, I want to see who. Is there anybody here you forgot to use your mouth? You were hungry. Then you suddenly remember that ah, I have a mouth. <laughs> Did you forget to use your mouth? I want to tell you something. The life you are living is the result of your mouth. Hey, come on now. There's some of you who are very slim. Thin is the word. You've become very thin. And some people are troubled about you, right? Like, brother, is there a problem? You try and eat. You look so feeble. You say, I can't eat. I try. So why are you like this? Because of what you are eating. It is so small. So you're, you know? And so when you come... <laughs> it's about what? Food. Then you have some that are what? Big. I like the way one lady said it. She said, I'm not fat, I'm full. <laughs> that was a nice one. But here's the point. Did you ever see anybody who said, hey, I just saw myself getting fat on the bed. I didn't eat anything. I've just been getting fat. I don't eat at all. Do you know anybody like that? No, some pretend like that. They say, I don't understand what I'm putting on with that. I, I don't eat much. It's not the one you are eating now. It's the one you ate before. <laughs> all right, here's the point. Here's the point. The point of all that is this. Your physical life, your physical life is a result of your mouth work. Everything your eyes see, you must eat. You know, somebody's getting fatter and fatter. And that, I don't understand. That. The thing is that I just love food. Anytime I see food, I don't. So you're going like this. Until you've changed size 14, size 16, 20, 23, only you. So now I want to show you what to do. Your mouth has made you what? Big. And your mouth probably also refused to let you what? Get big. So whatever you are seeing is not what mommy did. It's not what daddy did. If you are an adult, you are responsible for your size. Did you hear what I said? You are responsible. And if you don't like what you see in the mirror, 
You are responsible. Don't say, hey. They said I look like my uncle. <laughs> Let me tell you. I want to give you one secret. There's nobody, no human being that cannot be beautiful. There's none. I want to explain to you. Everyone, every human being has beauty inside. It's whether you can bring it out or not. If you don't like your dentition, it can be changed. You say it costs a lot of money. It's not true. Anything that's too costly for you, get it free. How? How? It is through the teaching that I'm giving you. Do you know what I used to say when I was a student? Years ago. See, some of these things you have to build the principles. Years ago. I would say nothing will ever be too expensive for me. If it is too expensive, I'll get it free. And some didn't understand what I was saying. But I had that mentality. I had that mentality. They had to build it into my consciousness. Jesus didn't die for nothing. Glory to God. So now, you've been using your mouth every day. This your mouth works. Every day. Food, drink, only you. Your mouth keeps working. Working, working, working. I want us to change the focus of what you've been using your mouth for. Because there's a higher, a higher purpose for your mouth than for eating and drinking. Are you aware there are people in the hospital who are not using their mouth for food? There's a pipe going into their body. Huh? A host of some kind through which they are fed. They are not dying. And some people are sick of a certain kind of sickness. They can't take in any food through the mouth. They go around with a sack that is now part of their daily dressing. You don't see it. It's inside their jacket. It's hanging somewhere in the body. It's connected to the body. They're like a car that you drive to the petrol station and you plug something to fuel it. They too, they arrive somewhere and they plug something and feed that sack with food. It's all fluid. And then they go, they, are, they feel normal. As they move around, that sack that is connected to the body is feeding them. They never eat anything through the mouth. They can't. That is the sickness. You know, at the healing school, we see all kinds of things. All kinds of things. You'd be amazed that people suffer so much. But the reason I'm saying that is this. Just to let you know that your mouth was not given to you for eating and drinking. And for some others, they use their mouth only in cursing people. They say, ah, this is my mouth. If I use my mouth only. <laughs> they even, they are proud of the bad things that come out of their mouth. They say, this is my mouth. And they laugh about it. They say, my mouth can put me in trouble. Your mouth has already put you in trouble. It's not, it's not about to. He has put you in trouble already. You are in trouble. We are talking about how to come out of it now. Glory to God! Every day, every day, hear me, hear me. The word of God, you don't need to stand before a crowd to use the word. The word of God is for you to use for your life. Every day. Listen, you pray. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. Bless me this day, oh, Father. Oh, <laughs> Is that crying? Mm -mm. That's not Christian prayer. Oh, Father. Because. Mm. That's not prayer. That's not Christian prayer. 
I know there are people who, they think it's humility when they're praying. They start crying, oh, Father, we are nothing before thee. Oh, Father, it's not for you. It's not for you. If you like, fall down there and cry. <laughs> Nothing will change. People have been praying like that for so long without a change in their lives. That's not Christianity. Look, let me show you something. Imagine this. Imagine, imagine that you had a lot of money and you came to, you saw a young guy even an adult, whether he's old or young, <laughs> you met him with rags, looking so bad, crying, weeping. And you said to him, what's the problem? He said, I was driven out of the house and um, uh, I have nowhere to stay. Then you said to him, where is the house? He shows you the place. Some people who, have, who, who live there, they said they don't want to see him again. They don't like him, so he shouldn't even come around. Now you have come to the place, and you say, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'll buy this house for you. <laughs> then you pay for the house. You take him to the lawyers. They sign everything in his name. You come back, you eject everybody there. They all leave. Then you put money in the account. For him and you say from today you don't have any problem this house is yours okay he says thank you sir thank you sir <laughs> thank you sir <laughs> then after dancing and dancing and dancing three months later you are coming by that area you see him in rags the same way that you saw him three months ago you come and say young man What's the matter? I said, even if it's an old man, old man, young man, anyone. You say, what's the matter? He says, I don't know. I don't know why my body is doing me. I don't know. So what's the matter? What about the house? You say, the house, the house. What about your house? The house. Praise the Lord, the house. Do you live in the house? Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just need your help. What do you want? I need a house. Oh, I receive. I receive. I thank you for the house. Have you not been living there? Oh, he's not acting confused. Oh, I receive. Mm, I receive. Thank you, sir. I'm blessed. Thank you, sir. Don't you think something is wrong with him? He's insane. But that is how many Christians are behaving. They are thanking the Lord. Mm, mm, hey, hey. A month later, they are in the same situation they were. They say, Lord, thank you. I thank you for that job. I receive. Amen. They received last month. They are back again. Amen. Mm -mm. I receive, Lord. Amen. Woo. Amen. I'm blessed, Lord. They said it last month. They are back to the same situation. Say no, 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 no. Say no. no. Listen. Your mouth. The Bible says something inside your mouth is the rudder. Okay, that directs your life, your tongue, which forms the words in your mouth. It directs your life. You're going to go like this or you're going to go like this. It depends on you. Hey, uh, uh, uh. now this next few minutes, don't miss anything. This is the closing part. Don't miss anything. Hebrews chapter 11. Don't miss anything now. Hmm. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read from verse 1. To verse 3. Are you ready? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence, the evidence 
of things not seen the evidence of the money that I have that you haven't seen the evidence of the success that I have that you haven't seen the evidence the evidence of my victory the evidence faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence faith we read it in Romans chapter 10 verse 17 faith that evidence comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God when I receive the word faith comes to my spirit I have the evidence for my victory I have the evidence for my success I have the evidence for my glorious life I've got the evidence in my spirit faith is the evidence you say brother where is it I say I have the evidence the evidence the evidence is in my words is in my actions faith is expressed in words and actions words and actions are you following this now all right go back to the scripture now faith is the substance that means calling substance that which you hope for glory to God it has gone beyond hope to the now faith is the substance substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen next verse for by it by it the elders you know in the in the few verses after he starts mentioning the elders okay people like Abraham Isaac Jacob Noah you know talks about all those guys the elders. He says, for by it by faith the elders obtained a good report ah, yeah, 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 yeah. they obtained a good report meaning that God God declared them excellent good reports so it was not anything else but faith they obtained a good report by faith which means they are standing in heaven is because of faith they have a glorious standing they are recognized in heaven it was faith that did it he says they obtained a good report by faith their faith gave them a good report now next verse <sighs> follow this very carefully he says through faith we understand that the words now that word is aeon the cause of life the life and times are you following this now the systems the errors Hi-ya. through faith we understand that the worlds were framed the word is catatizo are you following this it means to be perfected to be brought into a perfect situation the way it should be it means arranging things the way they are supposed to be are you following this it means constructing it means that you give a shape to something the way it should be for example if your life is not going the way it's supposed to go because for a child of God there is a way your life is supposed to go if it is not going in that direction you can cut a tizzle. are you hearing me He says through faith we understand that the words were friends 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 by what by hands no by the word of God and you know what that word there that says word by the word is not the logos but the rhema it means the spoken word higher through faith we understand that the words the aeons were friends arranged by the rhema of God here's another part so that the things so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear shout amen somebody you know what in the next few months you're going to be working on something are you hearing me hear this let me tell you what to do you can pick one day of a special kind of fasting this fasting is not is not food fasting it's a fasting of words so that throughout that day you have consciousness of your you're using your words to appeal your future you can write down the things you're going to be saying and you maintain your composure 
Are you hearing me? You say those words again and again and again and again and direct your life and direct the course of things in your life. Arrange everything, go ahead and yeah.